So Romans is where we're at, and we're going to finish up chapter 13 here today, verses 8 through 14. Uh, Chapters 12, 13, and 14 of the book of Romans, as you know, move from uh, chapters 1 through 11, a lot of indicatives, a lot of teaching and uh, 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 instructing us what is true about the gospel. And as we look at the book of Romans, I think I've sort of highlighted these three overall themes for you before. Paul seems to want to clarify the gospel unify the believers, unify the church there in Rome, and also inspire mission. We need all three of those today in our day and time as well. And it's interesting how when you clarify the gospel, you do unify believers. The more I come to understand that I've been saved by grace through faith in Christ, um, the more I find I'm able to love others. And my heart is, it becomes tender because I'm humbled by the grace of God at work in my life. And now all of a sudden I find myself loving others who I may or may not otherwise like or love at all. And this is what the gospel does. It starts to turn us inside out, upside down, change us, transform us, and now we find ourselves being united in Christ. And then inspired to mission, yeah, that's awesome. The gospel at work, grace in motion in a church like this, in a city like this, uh, is a really wonderful thing. It, it's, it's kind of what C.S. Lewis called a, a good infection. And we hope it spreads. So as we study through books of the Bible here at the Village Chapel, uh, anybody need a copy at all, raise your hand. We've got some extra ones. We'll pass those out. You can follow along. So you got something to look at as we go through this text. Uh, Romans um, 1, 16 to 17, I want to put up on the screen too. And just to remind you uh, of our basic thesis to this, the longest of Paul's letters, the book of Romans. And we read this aloud together because I'm going to sort of get this, you know, written, etched into your hearts a little bit. Matter of fact, let's see who can repeat what was on the last slide. Don't put the last slide up there, but what were the three overall themes of Romans? Clarifying the gospel, unifying believers, inspire mission. Beautiful. You did so well. It's great. It's like you've had two cups of coffee or something. So. It's really good. And so here we have the thesis really for the overall book. All three of these really do show up here, at least implicitly. Would you read this aloud with me then? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Not the righteous shall live by works, not the righteous shall live by being religious. The righteous shall live by faith. That faith directed to the object, Jesus Christ, who is our, not only the source of our faith, but the object of our faith and the one that we come to worship. When we worship, uh, he is the object of our worship. He is the one who we hope is just receiving with great joy and delight our praise and our worship as we sing to him and as we pray to him and as we study his word. Now, verses 8 through 14. Take a look with me. Uh, Set your eyes on the page. It says, Oh, oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Some of your translations may say, um, instead of fulfilled, it may say something else, but that's essentially what it means. Um, This is... God's law at work in our lives. It looks like something, and it looks like we love our neighbors. Who's my neighbor? Anybody I come in contact with. Doesn't matter if they believe what I believe or not. Doesn't matter if they look like I look or not. They're my neighbor because we're in proximity. We're close to one another. I think the more we believe the gospel, the more we come to embrace what the Bible teaches, the more we start to understand that my life doesn't belong just to me. It belongs to everybody else. And especially when it comes to Christians, everybody who belongs to Jesus belongs to everybody who belongs to Jesus. You know, again, it doesn't matter whether we look the same, dress the same, whether we even act the same in some of our cultural uh, options, but when it comes to our life with God, when it comes to our personal holiness, the Bible is what's steering, guiding, leading, and directing us, and it is what teaches us to love our neighbor. Um, So, for this, and then he goes back, reaching all the way back in the Old Testament, he says, you should not commit adultery, you should not murder, you should not steal, you should not covet. And that's because that's not loving someone else. That's why the law says what it says. The law is actually really good for us. 
Um, it's, it's God's standards. It's the way God designed life to work. And so it's good. It's a good schoolmaster, and it points us to Christ, our need for a Savior, because none of us can actually live up to this law. We've all broken uh, virtually every one of the commandments one way or another. And so he reminds us of what those are there, and he says, if there's any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Fact is, nobody in this room has done that. We've all broken that command. Um, how do I know that? I, just because I've been on the planet, and I'm me, and I'm struggling with it myself, you know? Um, love does no wrong to a neighbor right there. That's, oh my goodness, that's, the bar is so high here. That's pretty amazing. It does no wrong to a neighbor whatsoever. Remember, Jesus is the one who, you know, took the Ten Commandments, took it even higher up to think in your heart to lust after one, uh, another woman is to commit adultery, to, to have hate in your heart towards someone is, is, is just as bad or worse than killing them, murdering them. And all of that happens inside of our hearts because we're, or unfortunately, we're just not that loving. We're kind of curmudgeonly sometimes. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. How many of you get cranky this week? Anybody get cranky this week at anybody? Okay, yeah, that's pretty. So I like that. Confession's good for the soul here. Um, I did, I honestly did, you know, and, and uh, after rep I find myself, you know, having to repent, like there's no, my sin's nowhere more obvious than my own home or out of my courtyard, you know, the patio or in the neighborhood. It seems like the, it's just really intense there, you know, my sin, you know, and it's real obvious, you know, and uh, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Yeah, that neighbor. You know, the one that annoys you so much. Um, therefore, love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. I love that. that. That's part of verse 10. And this do knowing the time. I love this. Verse 11 is just, he's going to put a sense of urgency to all this. This do knowing the time, that it's already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. I, uh, how many of you love a good nap? Okay. So here's what I did the other day on our day off. Um, Kim and I did. We, we decided to e eat breakfast and then take a nap. It, isn't that a, now that is a good schedule right there. And then what we did was we woke up to go eat lunch. And guess what we did after that? We took a, that's right, it was napping day. I love, and in the summer, it just seems like you can fall asleep really easy, even those of us that you know, the motor's always running and you're always churning, you know, and all that sort of thing. It's just with the humidity and the heat and everything, you just kind of find yourself pretty easy to fall asleep in the light. Let's don't do that spiritually. Let's don't fall asleep in the light of the gospel. He says here, it's time to wake up from our sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. And that, um, remember, he's been talking about justification by faith and that this is a one done for all act of God. Yes, that's true. Uh, we place our faith in Jesus Christ. Our salvation is secure in Christ. That's very true. But there is a day coming when this salvation, this wholeness, will be realized in its fullness. And that day is coming, Paul says. It's each and every minute, tick of the clock, it's a little closer. I love the Christian faith for being so forward-looking that one day, no more tears, no more disease, no more death, no more disunity over trivial things. Um, I love that we're looking forward to that. And the night is almost gone, Paul says, verse 12, and the day is at hand. Everything is about urgency, immediacy right there. Notice all that language there. The night is almost gone. The day is at hand. Let us, therefore, lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. He'll use this metaphor of putting on twice, once here in verse 12, once here in verse 14 in a minute. But, and they're essentially the same thing, but he's saying it a couple of different ways. And I like that. I like that about the Bible, that often the Lord would inspire the writers of the Bible to say things from a couple different angles because we're all different. We're wired different. We hear things. We perceive things differently. Maybe putting on the armor of light, that image for you, actually, you, you connect with that because you have a very, very poetic imagination. And in this world that is pretty dark, morally and spiritually, even though it's a beautiful sunny day out today, but there are those out there that really feel this darkness that has taken over 
our world. And what Paul says then is put on the armor of light. He's not saying drum up your own light. There are a lot of religious belief systems that would say, look inside, that's where the answer is. The Christian faith does not say that. The Christian faith says we need outside help because we can't do this. And so there's a God in heaven who has come down in the person of Jesus Christ, who's actually said he's the light of the world and he's come to make us his reflecting lights, kind of like the moon. Moon doesn't have any of its own light. The moon reflects the light of our sun, right, in our, in our solar system. And so he says, put on the armor of light. In this dark day, don't just get sucked into the vortex of of the darkness that's all around you as people are despairing over this and over that. Don't let that happen to you. Put on the armor of light. What's armor supposed to do? It's supposed to protect you. But it's not your light. It's his light, and that's why it protects you. Okay? Let us, he gets real specific here. He's going to mess with some of us in a big way. Let us behave properly as in the day, and that's as opposed to as in the darkness, not in carousing and drunkenness. That's pretty specific, isn't it? Not in sexual promiscuity. That's pretty specific, isn't it? Uh, And sensuality. There's a tone about the world that we live in. It's obsessed with sexuality. Doesn't matter if they're selling a car or a life insurance policy or a trip to the, you know, to the beach or whatever. There's always some aspect of it that's appealing to sensuality and that aspect of things. We're just obsessed with sec- sexuality right now. Not in strife and not in jealousy. This is Paul writing to the church and saying, Don't allow those things to overtake you. Behave properly as in, as people who are children of the day, children of the light, not ruled by these things. Do you see how our world is ruled by these things? Paul says, don't let these things be the center for you. Um, and, And some of these things, I mean, God created sex good as a good thing with purpose and intent and design. Um, and God created relationships really good. And Jesus' first miracle was turning water into, yeah. But anything God creates good, we found a way, haven't we, to distort it and twist it and use it in ways that God calls destructive for ourselves because then it becomes the center, then it becomes our identity. And he says, no, no, that's not where you're to find your your identity. And then here's the second, put something on, verse 14, I love this, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting, he doesn't say, but put on our articulation of the gospel at the village chapel. No, he says put on Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the way, the truth, and the life is a person, and we learn from him uh, this, with specifics, what that looks like, but it's all wrapped up in Him. Christianity is about Christ at the center. So he says, put on Christ, Jesus as your Lord. Make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. And again, these are, we, we could come here in our day and time, we could read these things, it could go in one ear and out the other, and we might not think it means anything, but it really does mean something. It meant something in the first century, and it means something to us even now in our own day and time. It's interesting that in this last part of Romans chapter 13, Paul does not separate love and law, but holds them fast together. He's been teaching us about justification by faith in Christ that no one can be justified by works of the law. He's been teaching us that very solidly, very clear, right? Okay? But he doesn't just simply abolish the law. What he shows us is that the laws of God, the standards of God, the directives, direction, the teaching of Scripture, the, uh, all of the 
propositional truths that we find in Scripture about God's laws and God's ways. These are good things for us. And they actually inform us, inspire us, and show us what loving God looks like and what it would mean to love others as well. You can see this um, passage at work in the life of a guy like St. Augustine. I don't know if some of you know this story or not, but um, back in uh, 386 when Augustine, who had been living a pretty debaucherous life himself, using people constantly just for his own pleasure uh, and his own gain, um, he was spending some time in Milan while outdoors. He heard a voice of a child singing a song, the words of which were, pick it up and read it, pick it up and read it. I have no idea what style of music it was. You know, was it... Pick it up and read it, yeah. Pick it up and read it, yeah. I don't know. It could have been a country song. Could have been any number of different styles. I don't know what they were doing in Milan for music back in 386. Um, but he heard these words and he thought it first was just this little song, these kids sort of playing a game. Pick it up and read it, pick it up and read it, right? Then it kind of dawned on him that it might be a command from God to open and read the scriptures. He located a copy, opened it up, and read the first passage he saw. And I don't know if you've ever done that, where you do that Bible roulette thing, you know, God, speak to me, please, God, speak. I'm, it's dangerous to do that. It really is, you know. It's not always good. You, I, I've, you probably heard the joke. I've told it a million times, but I'm going to tell it again because it's fun. Um, I've done it before. You go, Lord, speak to me. And, you go, and Judas went out and hung himself, you know. <laughs> And you go, oh, I'm so inspired. Thank you, Lord. Speak to me, Lord. Please, I'm so alone. I need you, desperately need your help. <laughs> go thou and do likewise. <laughs> That's not helpful. Bible roulette, not a safe thing. But in this particular case, God overrode Bible roulette for Augustine, and really uh, an amazing thing happened. Um, he read verses 13 and 14, what we call verses 13 and 14. They weren't even called verses back then, but he read, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. And here's a man who really had un just engaged in unbridled indulgence of the flesh. And the Holy Spirit quickened him. And later he writes about that experience and, and he, he talks about how um, uh, he uh, came to this conclusion that all of the things that he had pursued really weren't in any way causing his soul to flourish. They weren't in any way causing him, to, giving him the rest, the peace that he was looking for in life. And so he then wrote, you have made us for yourself and our hearts will be restless until we find our rest in thee. That's really, really true. Um, I love the way Paul holds um, fast to justification by faith when it comes to our salvation. And at the same time, he tells us we have to respond in repentance and faith, believing the gospel, receiving God's free gift of salvation. We do not all of a sudden become passive in this whole thing. Hit me, Lord! Make me holy! Now, it's a, gospel's an invitation it's an invitation and a declaration. It's a declaration of what Christ has done, but it's an invitation for us to repent and believe, to come to him with empty hands of faith, lift them up and receive as a gift what we can't purchase, what we can't earn, but what he is eager to give. Um, but he doesn't separate his will or his ways from his love. John the apostle knew this as well. In 2 John 5 and 6, now I ask you, lady, as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which... Now, not, not as if I was writing you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is a commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. You see how they are inextricable. Love and obeying God. Love and God's ways. In our day and time, in our culture, love means so many things, man. It's just one of those words that has just been sort of watered down in every single way. Um, you know, people talk about making love, and what they mean is a, is a physical act, and that's all they mean. Um, people talk about falling in love as if they're victims of, of some, oh, I got swept away, 
here, I just couldn't. It's like going down the water slide and there's just no turning back you know, or whatever. And listen, I'm all about romance, man. I love romance. I've been married 38 years. <laughs> and my wife is my, my best friend. Does she ever make me mad? No. Yes. <laughs> Do I ever make her mad? Do I ever frustrate her? Yes. Is love hard? Is love tough? Yes, it's much harder for her than for me. <laughs> but love, in the way the world talks about it in our day and time, is such a lightweight veneer thing. It's, I love you for now. I love you until I don't like you anymore. And it's not really a commitment anymore. It's just kind of... I don't know, it's just kind of a Hollywood thing. It's just kind of a, you know, I don't mean to besmirch any particular industry or any particular brand in any particular industry, but it sure seems like it's been trivialized. We use the same word to say, to describe how we feel about pepperoni pizza that we use to describe how we feel about our wives or our husbands. I love pepperoni pizza. And Kim certainly wants to be more than a slice of pizza in my life. Um, and this is, this is so true. So think about that word love and just understand it's not hashtagable. We cannot trivialize it. In our day and time, that's essentially what is happening to a lot of things. We're thinking it, a hashtag, oh, I'll show everybody else, I'll hashtag it, and then, oh, that'll be the final word on everything on that subject. No, it's not. The really meaningful, the really deep and rich wonders of my 38-year marriage could never be hashtagged. And so Paul, in Romans 13, 1 through 7, talks about our role and responsibility to civil authorities. We studied that last week. And he calls us to love our city. Just like in the Old Testament, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're hauled off to Babylon. And there they are in exile, all the Jewish people. And they get on their knees and they're praying and God says to them, here's what you do, guys. Hashtag never Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> no. Actually, in Jeremiah 29, he tells his people to love and bless the city they live in, which is Babylon. You mean love and bless a pagan city? Yeah, love and bless a pagan city. Love and bless neighbors that are pagans that don't believe what we believe? Yes, love and bless them as well. Look, there's a lot of chaos in the world in which we live. There's a lot of not love going on in the world in which we live. There's a lot of people really angry right now. And some of them are just afraid. And it's because their trust is in something that isn't God. Their trust is in politics. Their trust is in economies. Their trust is in any number of things, which may or may not be good or bad or whatever in, in, in and of themselves. But if your trust is in finite stuff, let me just tell you, it's not going to work out well for you. And at some point, you're going to be clinging so tightly to that that you'll miss that which is greater than all of it, his love for you, where you can, as Augustine said, rest in his love. Um, so first, love is the fulfillment of God's law. We've got to at least notice that in verses 8 through 10. And he, he says it exactly like that. So love and law go hand in hand. Each informs the other, inspires the other, and it helps to express the other. With God's law, I now know what it's like to love my neighbor. With God's law and the information that's in it and the inspiration that's in it, I now know what it means to express my love to someone who I don't agree with. Even with God's law, even I'm, I'm, I'm challenged to love my enemies. You know? So this is really different when it comes to a religious belief system, just on that level. But it's also different because what's really cool is that Paul's already taught us the love of God, that's the ability to love people that are, you're, that are rebelling against you, the people that are fighting against you. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Romans 5 already teaches us, has already taught us that. 
So in other words, when he says, put on the armor of light, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, we're robing ourselves, we're simply stepping into something that's been offered to us that isn't ours. The love of God to now turn and give away to others who might be our natural born enemies. John Stott, love needs law for its direction while law needs love for its inspiration. So the laws of God give us direction. This is what love looks like. Don't lie to your neighbors. Don't cheat on a covenant promise you made. Don't steal. Don't murder. You know, some of this you'd think they wouldn't have even had to articulate. Because as Romans 1 tells us, it's written into our hearts. Every single human person knows it. Whether they're Bible believers or not, every single human person understands there's a moral law. So where did that moral law come from? We're not going to find it in the mic under a microscope or in a telescope. The moral law is written into our hearts by the moral law giver. Uh, we have a class that's beginning to study mere Christianity um, it's a 50 and older class. They meet at 8.30 on Sunday. You want to be a part of that? That's how Lewis starts his argument. If you're 49, you may go. <laughs> you can be an old soul and jump into that class is what I've been told anyway. Stott's right. We need the clarity of the law for direction so that we know what love looks like. But we also need the love of God poured out in our hearts because, frankly, I don't have it in me to love some people. If you're here and that's you and you don't have it in you on your own steam to love somebody you can think of, please raise your hand and join me. Oh, come on. <laughs> More honesty is needed in our church, yeah. Uh, George MacDonald, the love of our neighbor is the only door out of the dungeon of self. George MacDonald, uh, a Scottish author, poet, uh, Christian uh, minister, Im great impact on C.S. Lewis in Lewis's Coming to Faith, but he's got it right here. There's a dungeon, and it's myself. It, I, am, I am in prison in my dungeon of self, me, myself, and I, the three most important people on the planet, and I need to be set free from that, and the only way that can happen is through the gospel, is through God coming and breaking through and me beginning to love neighbor gets me out of putting me first. Um, so let me challenge you something. Give away, what is it you need you're looking for from somebody else? Give away what you need. You think you need X, Y, Z from your spouse. You think you need X, Y, Z from your neighbor or your coworker, whatever it is. Whatever that is, isolate what that is and start to give that away yourself to others. And let the love of God flow through you in a way that you probably normally hadn't thought of it because you've been thinking about yourself the whole time. Peter Kreef, God is love and love is not L-U-V. L-U-V is nice. L-O-V-E is not nice. L-O-V-E is a fire, a hurricane, an earthquake, a volcano, a bolt of lightning. L-O-V-E is what banged out the big bang in the beginning and love uh, is what went to hell for us on the cross. This is so true. I, I love these images because this, it just really, you know, the, the whole sort of Hollywoodization or whatever you call it of, of love, the trivialization of love, this just so speaks to that. Uh, you know, it's, just, it's deep, it's rich, it's like super thick dark chocolate, man. It's awesome, this love of God. Um, uh, and, and yet, it's also tumultuous in some ways, isn't it? You probably have some of that going on in a relationship. You have, I mean, uh, I'm, Kim and I are like this. I'm more of a philosopher, sort of a Mr. Mr. Think or Mr. Kind of Steady Eddie guy like this all the time. And so we, we got those new, you know, those cups that you get that are like the ice never goes away. You know the ones I'm talking about? It's so like last night we put ice in them, right? It'll probably be in there next week. Same ice, right? Somebody gave us a couple of these cups. So we decided, how are we going to tell our two cups apart? So I picked a blue straw because I'm always kind of the cool, you know, even cute kind of guy. And she said, what straw should I pick? I said, honey, you get the red straw. You are passion. You are a hurricane. You are, you are all those things. And she'll say, oh, you tether me. And I go, no, you float me. I need that. Otherwise, I'd be a brick all the time, just a 
big old rock that's kind of hanging around. And I need that. And I need her and she needs me in that regard. And love is deeper, much deeper than just a feeling. It is a bolt of lightning. And, and it takes that to crack through some of our pride and some of our anger. It takes God doing that so that we can, so that he can begin to pour his love through us to somebody who we might think of as unlovable. Secondly, and finally, two points today, okay? So, you guys, union with Christ ultimately determines our core identity. I think that's what we see in verses 11 to 14. There's really such a crisis throughout our culture these days when it comes to human identity, and it's in more than one category. Please don't think I'm only zeroing in on one category. We desperately need to rediscover a biblical anthropology in our time. This is huge right now. What does the Bible say a human person is? We're going to spend one of our uh, Burgers and Bibles nights on this. What does it mean to be a human person? What's the source of human life? What's the purpose of human life? How does the idea of God come into play when discussing such things? And look here what Paul says. <laughs> he says, Wake up. The world is being covered with darkness. Put on the armor of light. Put on Jesus Christ. Don't cave into everything the world around you is caving into as it falls into the abyss of darkness. But let the brilliance of the, 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 the luminous gospel of grace flood you and and let, let, the, let the robe of Christ's righteousness be put on you. Make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. And as I say, if, if that was true back then, man, it's all the more true today in our time. I think we've got to recover the understanding that our union with Christ is what ultimately determines our core identity. If we don't, we'll be swept away in the raging cultural current of confusion about what it means to be a human person. We'll allow ourselves to be defined by these finite things like money, sex, and power, instead of finding our identity in Christ Jesus himself. I love the way Brennan Manning said this in Prophets and Lovers. He said, Christianity then comprises more than involvement in civil rights, eco ecology, conservation, peace programs, and war on poverty. He's not saying those things are bad. He's just saying Christianity is more than that. It's more than fullness uh, of life in the spirit. It, he's, what he's saying is that fullness of life in the spirit is more than finding Christ in others and serving them there, him there. It's a summons to personal holiness. That's what Paul has called us to here. Ongoing conversion. That means transformation, changing. Everything's converting. And new creation through union with Christ. Put on Christ Jesus as Lord. It's huge. Kevin DeYoung in The Hole in Our Holiness, great book. Fellowship with Christ does not exist apart from fealty to Christ. Some of you are out there going, good, what's fealty? It's a loyal, um, a loyal commitment and submission to the one you call Lord, okay? So that when he says, love your enemies, when he says, love your neighbor, when he says, lay down your life for others, you're willing and ready to do that because that's what he did and he showed you how to do it and so you just want to be more like him. Todd Billings, since we were not created to be autonomous and see our world would try to teach us that we were created to be autonomous, but we aren't. We weren't created to be self-made people, but we were created to be in communion with God. When the Spirit leads us back into communion with God and Christ, we do not lose our true selves. We regain them. We become who God created us to be in union with Christ. And that's what Paul has said here. Put on Christ. Find your identity in Him, not in something else that's finite, not in something lesser than Christ. When Christ is preeminent, everything else takes its proper role. It's not enough just to analyze the times. We've got to wake up, look up, get up, and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not merely Christ-likeness that we're to put on, but rather Christ himself. Religion is behavior modification. The gospel is heart and mind transformation. Submit yourself to him. Put on Christ. And go out into the world to serve as his sons and daughters, agents of grace in a world that really, really needs hope and joy. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this passage. Thank you for the hope of the gospel. Thank you for joy in the life of the Spirit. 
I pray that you'd open each one of our eyes just a little bit more today. We might be able to see how much we need you, that we might be able to see how much more of you we need. That, Lord, today wouldn't just be, oh, I felt spiritually fed today, but actually I felt that my hunger for you is increasing. My hunger for your word is increased. I want more of you. I pray that that would happen for all of us, Lord. You send us out into the world to reflect your light and your love to a world that so desperately needs it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.